method we are exploring is how to bring student voice into the classroom. And we have, it was going to be five, but six of us couldn't make it, it was the girls well. So we have four educators uh, this afternoon with us. And they're going to share their uh, tips and resources with you. And we're going to do this in a table format. So brief introduction and a small light. Okay, so my name is, can you hear me? All right, awesome. So my name is Carrie Gallagher. Um, I'll stand up so you can see. I'm the assistant principal for teaching and learning in St. John's Prep, which um, for those of you who are local, you may already know about, but if not, um, it's an all boys school in Danvers, Massachusetts. We have grades six through 12. We have about um, 1,500 boys on campus. We're one to one with iPads. Part of my position is overseeing the vision for what teaching and learning should look like at St. John's, um, making sure that our teachers are doing a healthy mix of really important traditional academic skills while providing really innovative, you know, choice-filled learning experiences for our students. So what I'm gonna share with you today is some of the really awesome student products that have come out of our classrooms at St. John's um, because we're a nice, uh, we have a faculty that's like chock full of PhDs, but we're also um, a tech-infused place. And so you can see about the power of those two strengths and those two worlds colliding. And I'll hopefully, um, we're going to try to pack a lot into the, into the little 10 minute rounds. I'll also provide you with a strategy. 15, in our, 15, minutes. 15 minutes, even better. I'll provide you with a strategy to bring back to your schools to get that traditional, strong, rigorous academic mindset and that innovative, um, tech infused mindset and get them to come together. So we'll do it in our little round and then it's like a strategy you can bring back and do in like a PD or a faculty meeting at your school. And kind of your point, your table us. My point, my table is in the back corner. organizations, 
um, disruption and dismantling in a really positive collective way, I'm in the back right corner. Thank you. And Ashley Lamps in third from Curio Learning and a long time uh, veteran educator, right? Yeah. And I'm going to be the one who stays seated. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, my name is Ashley Lamps Sinclair, and I just literally left the classroom on August 24th um, this past year to um, turn what was my side hustle, Curia Learning, into a full-time gig, um, which we are in the Learn Launch Accelerator program and I presented uh, yesterday for the demo day. Um, I'm here because my journey um, as, as an entrepreneur started with design thinking. Um, Three years ago, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation had a project called the Redesign Challenge, and they asked teachers around the country to submit solutions to problems in education. My idea was Curia, and I went and uh, went through the design thinking process, built a prototype for Curio, did some discovery testing, and then went through, lived in this world where I was straddling being an educator and being an entrepreneur, and as a result of that, realized that we've got many, many gaps that um, both worlds can, can cross, and so I most recently, as a, additionally to running Curio, I uh, started a program called School Startup, which is in Louisville, Kentucky. It's very similar, except that we are embedded cohorts of what I call teacher founders who are entrepreneurs within their schools. And so my topic is uh, teacher as entrepreneur, and I'm right here in the front. Thank you. And we don't have a specific protocol or process for how to do that. Uh, so you're going to just pick a table and spend 15 minutes with this educator and you get to uh, visit three tables. And I'll be the timekeeper, letting you know what time is up. Okay? Ready? Set? Go! go. <laughs> Tables! I'm a sixth grade teacher in Boxford, Massachusetts. Um, and I just, I like the idea that you can take something and do it beyond um, just being in a classroom. I like that. Uh, I'm Vanessa Boyle. I'm a sixth grade teacher as well. We work together. Uh, I was just curious to hear about what you developed. Okay. Cool. That, that helped me a lot because I don't know what to talk about. Okay. <laughs> I'm actually in higher ed. Just always looking for ideas on things to spice up the classroom. Alison Lady, on seventh grade science teacher, just interested in programming as well. What do you do? Okay, cool. Um, and Claire Warren, I'm a third grade science teacher, and uh, again, curious about the problems in the state. I'm Karen Levin, I'm the director of Studio and I'm back. Teachers around the city, I think teachers have brilliant ideas and want to kind of put those ideas front and center and bring their solutions to big problems. Um, so just a little, wanted to hear a little bit more about your idea and what you did and then you know, how you kind of thought about teachers uh, as people with their voice and, and how they can um, do really amazing things in and out of the classroom. Sam Ramos, work for EF Education First. Um, I really am just here to learn about Curio and one thing that we at EF are always doing is building partnerships with teachers and um, we're trying to think of new innovative ways of building those partnerships, fostering connections among teachers who are traveling with each other and figuring out ways that they can improve their professional practice through um, you know, sharing their learnings while traveling. And I'm Ann Coffin Frederick and I work at Learn Lunch and I'm there Chief Academic Officer, and I got to learn lunch after my career in education. Uh, and people would say I was an entrepreneur, and I was like, what is that? I was just making trouble for everybody and trying to do things differently. And um, I know what Ashley's been up to, and I think she's doing some great work. And so I wanted to sort of hear the conversation and understand what you guys are thinking as well. Awesome, thank you. That helps me a lot because I wasn't sure if you wanted, if you cared about me. So I'll, I'll tell my story then because that sounds um, to be the root. 
So, yeah, like I said, I started with a redesign challenge, and I was, I think I was um, a 10-year teaching veteran at the end. Yeah, 10th year, right after the 10th year, maybe. And um, it was, like, the, a pivotal moment in my career because we, they, took, they sent us to, the Gates Foundation sent us to 1776 in D.C., and literally, it was the first time in my career, I remember having this moment. I was standing there and there were designers and Gates people and investors and tech engineers and whatever who were literally hovering around me asking me what I thought about education. And it was the first time in a decade long career where I felt like I was an expert, which was messed up <laughs> and not okay. And then the week, that it was also simultaneously when I became exposed to design thinking and I taught English so I immediately went back to my classroom and was like this is literally at the heart of what I do every day and so it, I just started infusing it into my curriculum and there was a lot of stuff out there that was for either design thinking to like change school policy or problems of practice or whatever and there was a lot there was a little bit more stuff around how to use design thinking if you're a STEM teacher but I was really interested in, like, how do I do this as an English teacher? Because to me, you know, empathy is about character analysis and literary study. And so I just started experimenting simultaneously with both. And then in the midst of that, I was named Teacher of the Year, how I know Joey from EF, of Kentucky, which gave me a sabbatical. And I went, um, I got a sabbatical for the second semester, and I um, met these 53 other amazing <laughs> powerhouse teachers who had started nonprofits, who had followings, who were on who were writing blogs and doing all this stuff, and, and then also getting like a national view of education. Um, and it just, it was just life altering. The Curio's motto is teach like a rebel. And the, the problem I was trying to solve with the Gates, the question the Gates asked was, um, how do you solve the problem of teacher professional development, in particular related to virtual, like digital space? Well, ironically, and this is true, the email came into my inbox and I deleted it because I don't care about professional development because usually it's terrible. And um, I certainly, I was a Luddite, I just got my first smartphone in 2016. So I also did not care about ed tech at all deleted it but then I went to bed that night and it hit me like a bolt of lightning I was like wait a minute I spend hours because I was up I had been up that night like googling for like cool ideas to do in my classroom I was like I spend hours and hours and hours trying to be a better teacher alone on my couch by myself and it's invisible and then I have to hit pause on that and I have to go sit in a workshop at school to prove that I'm trying to be a better teacher and it just was messed up and I was like wait a minute what do I do to try to be a better teacher well I try to discover new ideas I try to save them in some kind of sense of logical way so that I can find them later and then I try to talk to other teachers and collaborate and share ideas with them so what if there was an online space where that discover curate and collaborate that I'm already trying to do on my own could be in one place so it's simple easy and whatever also, being a Luddite, it had to be like, you know, totally easy to use. Um, and so that was kind of the idea, and I literally just filled out the quick application to Gates, and then they sent me to DC, and then that's how that story unfolded. And the teacher, Teach Like a Rebel, really came from this idea of like, I, I, I'm told. This is, this is a great anecdotal story that really explains it. I taught in a very impoverished school that was shut down eventually by the state. Um, and it was um, uh, I, constantly teachers were these kids can't read, these kids can't read. It became a mantra that eventually became true. And it, I spent hours just arguing with other teachers, like, what, no, and arguing with district people who wanted me to teach out of this book called, I'm not going to call them out, but they wanted me to teach this textbook that was started at a fifth grade level, ended at a seventh grade level, which don't get me started on levels, and they were like, this is the answer. This is going to save all of these kids, and you have to teach out of this book because if you don't, the district paid millions of dollars to this company, and you have to do it. And the books were moldy, and they were dirty, and they were terrible, and they had articles about Ricky Martin in them, and I was like, no, this is, I'm not teaching this book. And I fought all the time. I fought my colleagues. I fought the district people who would say to me, you have to do it. 
luckily, I had a great principal who had my back and knew what I was trying to do and believed in me and supported me and protected me. Um, and so I, I did projects and I did a Shakespearean garden and I did all of this stuff and my kids' scores were consistently higher than everybody else's and I wasn't even trying. That they, it just was because that's you know how you learn. And um, so that was, this idea of teach like a rebel was really, I met all of these other teachers of the year and literally it was like, we sat down at the breakfast table and it was like, well, I'm teacher of the year because I started this whole initiative and it was because there was a problem and I, I stepped in and I took over and I thought, wow, this, this idea of rebelliousness and creating trouble is really how you get stuff done as a teacher. And now with this program that I started, the school startup program, it is really, I mean, they're having to, I'm noticing on this side of it, there's a level of vulnerability that you have to be willing to expose and this the the courage that it takes to take even that small risk of telling the teacher in your department I don't think we should do that and I'm gonna do this instead and I noticed that I worked as an instructional coach last year which is how the idea of school startup came about and um, and I, I, I saw how they really these eight innovators who were in this program really carved a path, this idea diffusion of innovation, right? They carved a path for the rest of the school because what was happening, they, I'm thinking of the social studies department in particular, this one teacher wanted to do a very student-centered classroom, redesign the curriculum, and social studies in particular, they, history, it's facts, you don't mess with it, it's the way it is. And so he was having to constantly push back and push back. And as a result, what happened is the kids started loving his class and they would talk about it and they'd go down the hall and they'd tell the other teachers, oh, Mr. Cullen's doing this cool stuff and this is happening. And then those teachers who at the beginning of the year were naysayers were suddenly hanging around his door after school asking him, how did you do that and what did you do? And that's why this really this idea of like, teacher is entrepreneur just started to kind of aha, you know, it was just this really clear thing. Of, that's how you're going to change education is those teachers who are willing to be vulnerable, willing to take those risks, willing to sit in those meetings and push back and say, I'm not going to teach that book and I'm not going to do it this way because my kids, and that's what the idea of Curio too, is like the kids that I have in my classroom are not the same kids that you have in yours, even if we teach side by side. And I have to make different decisions for those kids every day, right? And you have a different decision to make. So if we have the same standard curriculum that we're all working in and nothing ever is flexible and there's no way to be creative and build upon it. Oh, sorry. I, I, I didn't leave time for you to ask questions. But if there's no flexibility, then, then you're not doing what's right for kids. You're just not. And so you have to empower teachers to make those small decisions that are invisible every day to do what's best for the human beings who are in front of them. And I'm done with my soapbox. Any questions? Sorry. <laughs> so what is your business? Are you consulting to schools? No, no, no. Curio is a platform, so it's free for teachers. And we've got a booth out there, so you're welcome to go like look at it. But um, it's just CurioLearning.com, and you can sign up. Um, we've got 700 users on it now, so you can play around with it a little bit. Um, it's a platform where you can basically take content that's online or files or documents, those things that those teachers at 11.30 at night are finding, they can put them into a visual organizer and they can build around those ideas and they can share them and have conversations with other teachers. Um, and so we're just getting started. Now, School Startup, the other program that I said, it is a consulting. Yeah, and it, it's specific to Jefferson County and Louisville, Kentucky, yeah. Are you familiar with is a similar kind of product, and it's free for educators, and it's curated, So one thing that, yeah, no, yeah, okay, I'll look it up. Um, one thing that, I will get pushback from a lot of investors and biz people is, how do you know these lessons are vetted? That, oh, thank you. I, um, that, that question drives me insane because a lot of the things that we get compared to, aside from Teachers Pay Teachers, which is another one we get compared to, are some teacher of the year or proven track record educator who has somehow proven him or herself this lesson works. And here, everybody else, the masses, you can have it. 
But the problem, like I had a, I had a principal in DC tell me the other day, I wouldn't use this product because I would want to make sure that I had 100% control over what my teachers were seeing. And she was a maker school, so she was like, I want this Harvard PhD guy with the proven research. I want his work in my classrooms and not a teacher in North Dakota who's just experimenting with maker spaces. The problem with that mentality, though, is that if you're a second year teacher and your principal says, we're all doing maker spaces, well, guess what? Guy from Harvard means nothing to you. Teacher in North Dakota who's just figuring this out is your source of sanity. So when I get really frustrated when I hear like vetted, curated content from whomever because to me, there's nothing more vetted than a lesson that has worked for a teacher in a classroom, period. Because that means some kid somewhere got it as a result of that. So that's me. Again, soapboxes, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay, right. start, thank Thanks. you. Start getting up. This way I'm so, get it going. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming to this um, to this session. So we're gonna do a little bit of co-designing together. If I can get my computer to go back to where it was. Let's see. Uh, I think I lost internet connection. Okay, so I have the privilege every day to work with young people and teachers and admin and community members and families co-designing and really using this framework to think about this idea that I keep pushing, which is those that are most affected by the design solution should be the primary designers in the process. So when we're thinking about kindergarten, I'm 43, I don't remember what it's like to be five. Right? I have an eight-year-old and 13-year-old, but I still don't remember what it's like to be five. So we have five-year-olds designing for five-year-olds, um, high schoolers designing for high schoolers, teachers designing for teachers. And there's clearly other stakeholders that are part of that process, but those most affected by the solution really should be at the heart of the process. And that's kind of the, the, the substance of this work. So um, I use the term co-designing um, a little bit more than design thinking. And I think of it in terms of the co in these words. So community-driven design, collective design, and cooperative design, and that being sort of the, the north stars of the work that I do. Um, I also wrote this definition for myself and for others, if it's helpful. Um, Co-designing is a framework. It's less of a process and you know, um, methodology, you know, it's, it's a framework, it's loose. You're going to use it in whatever way makes sense to you. It's a framework that encourages us to listen, to look, and trust in the power of collective insight and creativity, increasing the opportunity for multiple stakeholders um, to be shared visionaries and decision makers in their communities. Sure. And I think about that um, a lot because I think of who are in schools most often, young people and teachers. And often teachers don't feel like they're decision makers in, or visionaries in what's happening district-wide or city-wide. Um, and so I'm trying to work with people to change that. So I, um, I'm a very visual person. So when I thought about this framework, um, I thought a lot about what do we already have on our bodies. And that's eyes and ears, head, hands, and heart. And that means anybody can do this process. I try to stay away from a lot of the jargon and just kind of bring it back down to what um, we all naturally do. We're all designers. Five-year-olds are designers. Nature is by design. Um, and I sort of live in that space. So what I usually do is bring a whole bunch of people together and have them think about something that they've designed. And from that, we lay this framework or other frameworks on top of it. So um, we're going to do that today. We're going to do it super quick, because I heard we don't have tons of time. Is there, some, is there a burning? question or is there something that somebody at the table has been thinking about that's been keeping them up at night or getting them out of bed in the morning so we sort of start with this spark in this process over here so anybody want to go our friend over there said jobs of the future but it doesn't have to be that big what do you guys have been what have you been thinking about or worried about putting purpose behind the screen putting purpose behind Oh, the screens. So, um, how might we? Use screens in 
purposeful ways. Something like, how might we use screens in purposeful ways? Okay, so that's the spark here. So now we have to think about who needs to be at the table to talk about this design challenge, to talk about this. So we then move into the next part, which is awareness. So who is most affected by screen use from your perspective? I'm thinking more of the Gen Z millennial age group and that addictive cycle. Yeah, so what age is that these days? It's 33, 34 millennials, the upper, and then um, 1998, which is 20 years old, and under Okay, so... So probably like 13 to 30? 13 to 30. <laughs> Not my age range, but my son's. Okay, so 13 to 30. So we need to get those people at the table to co-design a solution because they're the most affected by this question of using screens in purposeful ways. Who's the next layer? Who's, in, who's the next layer of people that might need to be at the table? I would think it would be educators, ethicists, educators, tech, parents. Parents. Okay. So this is the next layer I usually use with awareness, right? So who am I as a designer? What's my identity, power, and context in the situation? Because you're going to come already with somewhat of a bias, which is you're not using them necessarily in the way I want to be using them, right? They might tell you something else, but it's important that you're all together in this conversation. That's the heart of the work. Then we move into learning. How will educators, um, students, or ki uh, young folks, 13 through 30, tech and parents, how will they get to know each other's perspectives? What are we hoping they do? Conversation. Okay. So we have a conversation. How else will they get to know about each other? Okay. Okay, so they might do that. Okay, so we're going to start first with this idea of they're going to talk. Could be an interview. Could be an observation. Okay. And that's why the eye is sort of on this one. It's over here too, right? So we've now, here's our issue, here's our concern, and now we've brought everybody to the table. We can see each other around the table, and now we're talking, we're observing, we're starting to collect data. Okay. Then we move into the head, where the ideas and the brainstorming come in. So now you've got all this data. What are you going to do with the data that you've collected? What do you do? No. So now everybody's talked. Ideas. Okay. So if you're going to, yeah. So before you jump to ideas, which is what we usually do, you got to make sense of this data. Yeah. So you look for patterns. You look for opportunities. You look for um, constraints motivations, frustrations. So you look at all those patterns of behavior that, you, that rise to the top or anything that makes sense. And what I tend to do is ask for three North Stars because now you got too much data and you got to make sense of it. So let's say, I'm just going to make this up, you find out that your stakeholders find it comforting to be checking their screens all the time. Let's say that they feel connected by checking their screens all the time. And let's say they feel, um, maybe they also feel exhausted checking all the time. Okay? I'm just going to pretend. Could be. Could be lonely too, right? So they feel, it could be the opposite of connected. They could feel lonely, confused. So let's say we, we go with the fact that they find it, um, they find it comforting. Okay. What are some ideas about why that's feeling comforting and how the screen could be purposeful? Anybody have any ideas? Connects them to everyone. Huh? It connects them to their friends. Connects them to their friends, right. So what's the so do you have an idea of having them feel connected? A sense of community. Yep. Okay. So friends and community might be at the heart of what it is, one of the ideas. So what? So now we're going to move into what can you test in the next three weeks 
this is usually what I push people to do. So now we got all these ideas. What are you going to do? What are you going to try so that millennials feel connected either through their screens in a purposeful way or without their screens? What are some ways you could test that out? Take your phones away. You could. You could. Yep. So you've done that. So at this point now, we have their, we, we have the creating a common narrative on the screen for them. Ah, okay, yeah. Create a screen with uh, narrative. Something that has a hub that they all talk about. Ah, hub. So create a hub. That's an idea. Anybody else? What else can you do? We now found out that all these folks want to feel connected. Higher level conversation. Even try and make them feel connected without using the screen. Okay. Yeah, so gather, screen. gather peep, peeps without screen. Uh, call it connect in person. Right? That's another idea. What's another idea? Acronyms, I-R-W, yeah. World. yeah, yeah. So you could have an in-person gathering where you really encourage people to connect without the screen. You can have a hub gathering because we're now saying that connection is a big piece of it. What else could you do? You could do a um, museum about screens and connection. What else could you do? The mindfulness training. Mindfulness training. Or yoga class. Yep. Or yoga. What else could you do? These are all. Yeah. Gamify connections. What else? Book clubs. Yeah. So now you've got these ideas, right? And you've gone from, I've got this problem where my teenager or all these kids that I know are always on their screens and it's starting to really, you know, bug me and bother me and make me frustrated to six to seven things that you can do in the next three weeks to try out with young people to help you think about this issue in a collective positive way versus it feeling like a nagging my teenager or whoever it is. So that's sort of like, the, that's the process that we use. I mean, the last group was Jobs of the Future, and they went through the same process, and they came up with um, some ideas around, you know, um, transforming a classroom into a future space with students and trying to figure out, well, what skills would I need in the future to a coding camp, um, you know, all sorts of different things. And so... The whole idea behind design thinking and community-driven design is that you get out of your head. And that's why you have this icon of hands. And then even if it fails and fails miserably, that was the right time for it to fail miserably because now you have some more information about the thing that was bugging you at the beginning. And then we just kind of, at the very, begin at the very beginning, the heart of all of this are the uh, community considerations. So be open to giving and getting from our collective experience and creativity. I might have had the answer for your question. 0% chance I did, but some people think they have the answer to everybody's question. But collectively, you now have seven prototypes to track. Um, be open to discomfort as a catalyst for shared insight. And be open to a co-constructed understanding of co-designing or design thinking. And then this, t this is just a really easy template that I use with folks, which is just my process. So I tend to, I'll, I'll use this, but to be completely honest, they come up with their own icons because they share something they've designed. And so one group came up with like a checklist, hands together, and a sundae with a cherry on top. Another group came up with an eye, um, the action, like clamp from like a movie, and then um, um, hearts all coming together. So really you can do any image you want. It depends on who the designers are in the room and what makes sense to them. But sort of this three part process seems to make a lot of sense um, in the work we do. So.
Any questions about all of that? So it's like drinking from the fire hose in 10 minutes. I'd, I'd love to hear about how you've um, applied this in Cambridge. Like yeah. What, is it, what does it look like? Or so um, a couple of years ago, I started a design lab. Um, and basically, people can, can dial in in different ways. I teach a course with educators, students, community members, and families that, that, that are together. Um, and it's a seven session course. Each session, we take one of these buckets and we sit in that space, and then folks go off for a couple weeks, come back with that information, then we sit in the next space, then they go off and they come back, and at the very end we story tell. Um, the superintendent usually comes to the beginning kickoff and is like, this is great, go off and do your thing, and then when things, during the storytelling session, people come in and listen, and then where it makes sense, we build it out. So there's the course, there's also workshops, I also like on a weekly basis. I'm up at the high school. Teach. I teach at the. Um, I'm with all the principals and deans at the high school, working on a design challenge over the course of the year. I took the curriculum coordinators through a design challenge over the course of the year last year. Um, I teach a design life course. I, I, you know, I do all these different things where young people can use this framework, but it's not always exactly the same. And then I coach one on one, and I coach at schools, um, and. Nonprofits in all sorts of places. So it looks, to, yeah, it's busy. But what's really cool is I just, I often just like this is a very loose framework, and I just listen. So what's the thing that's been bugging you? Who needs to be at the table? Right? It's just these questions. Who needs to be at the table? What do we need to learn? Okay, now that we've learned it, what are some ideas? What do we want to try? Did that work? Did it not work? Okay, let's try again. That's basically. It's like building with young kids when they're trying to build with blocks. It's the same kind of um, process. Okay. And that's kind of how it goes. And there's a website if you want to see all with, that has all the teacher interviews and kind of where it came about and news about it and resources are all on there too. So if you just type in Design Lab Cambridge, it's the first website that comes up. across from Meridian Latin? Um, I do it in Meridian Latin. I don't have a physical space. Because they have a design in the lab, right, across from Prince Prince Latin? Um, it's like a media arts. Thing. Yeah, media arts, yep. They do. So the I have a it's called the design lab, yeah, but there's no physical space. Like we squat. Yeah. Um, and it's if you can't find it there, just go to the CPS website. It's it's so uh, it's under the Office of Curriculum and Instruction. It's like a just it's a department now under the Is office. It just you? It's just me. It's just me, but I've partnered with um, Kari Milner, who's a co-director for the Agenda for Children, and then I'm also faculty for something called the Center for Artistry and Scholarship, and they're our fiscal sponsors when we were first starting to kick off. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Absolutely. Yeah. And you're always welcome to come to any session. We have people come and squat in all the time. Um, no, but everybody's been asking, so I should probably put it on. Yeah, that that's fine. Cool? I was gonna. Yeah, that's fine. I actually may present this way rather than the presentation because I think the slides are bigger this way. So I'm um, gonna try to give you as many examples of student work as I can in the very short time that we have. Um, but something that we've been thinking about a lot at St. John's Prep is how do you infuse creativity in students' learning experiences without losing the academic rigor that's the hallmark, right, of a prep school education that prepares our students to go to these Ivy League schools and all this stuff. Um, so um, the first thing that's really important for us to do is to kind of convince our teachers like that creative learning is something that we should prioritize at our school. It's also, it's hard sometimes to even convince the parents of our students of this, right? They send that they send their sons to our school for what they think is like this um, really high-end academic experience. So I really like what the MIT Media Lab has said, and I put it on this too so that it's kind of up the whole time for you to keep in mind um, that what the, the primary skill that the most um, sought after employers are looking for is the ability to creatively solve problems. So don't tell me that you're going to solve the problem the way we've always tried to solve it because that hasn't worked. We need a new way, which means we need our students to be willing to try new tools, take risks, be wrong, be comfortable with discomfort. And if we want them to be able to do that in these really high-end jobs that they're seeking, then we need to give them those experiences in our classroom so that they, ha they have experience with being uncomfortable, right? 
And that's what creativity provides. The next thing is defining creative learning because a really big misconception is that if you give students the power to create, it's like just letting them loose. Like learn whatever you want, however you want, and then the teacher is really not even like a guide or an expert, and that's not the case. If anything, you need the expert more in a creative classroom, not less. And it isn't really just unleashing the students to do whatever they want. There's lots of structure that has to be put in place. And if you ask like your middle school art teacher, they're brilliant at this because they have to come up with a way to provide enough structure so that an adolescent whose brain is already all over the place chemically so that they know what they are supposed to do but they feel as though they have the power to express themselves in a unique way. So structure with uniqueness is that is that that fine balance. So the way that um, the way that the MIT Media Lab defines creativity is that it has these, the creative process has these four hallmarks. So the first is projects. So we're most creative when we're doing tasks that are a part that will result in a much larger project at the end that we're invested in. Number two is peers. So that doesn't mean our students have to work in groups, but it does mean that even if, if they are working in groups, that's great. If they aren't, if they're working on an individual project, they should be doing it when their peers are around so that they can get that informal, informal feedback from their peers. That's just part of that natural learning process. Finally, passion. So we all know that we have curriculums that we have to teach. We don't really have a choice. Um, we have standards, skill standards, knowledge standards. So they're not always going to be passionate about what they're learning, but we can provide them with an opportunity to be passionate about how they'll learn it or what their final product will be and that's what creativity can tap into um, and finally play when you're asking students to be creative essentially that means that they're going to be using resources and tools that they probably have never used before or at least they've never used in the same way before so built into the project plan has to be some time for them to tinker and learn and play with the tool and that's not like oh I'm going to on the screen step by step demonstrate to you how to use like iMovie that's tell them to open an iMovie and figure it out. That's a really important part of the creative process for them. So I love starting with mathematics with my student examples because math teachers are notorious for saying, oh, that's great, but we can't do design thinking in math because it's either right or it's wrong, right? <laughs> or, oh, that's, 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 we don't do projects in math because it's math. It's like you do, the, you do the problem sets and then you take the test. So I love kicking it off with math because it sort of proves all of that wrong. So this was in a, um, this was in a, a very low level um, geometry class. Um, students who had really struggled with taking tests all year long. They're just not great test takers, no matter how much the teachers helped, tried to help with those skills. So this teacher wanted her students to be able to demonstrate what they learned without making them take a final exam, because that was like so anxiety provoking for them. So she said, all right, I will give you some parameters, but I want you to design your dream house. And you have to use certain geometrical concepts those are my parameters, but the rest of it, you can have whatever you want. You can have a jacuzzi room, you can have an indoor basketball court, you can have like the most epic video game room ever. Like, what, I mean, think about what your average teenage boy would want in the house. Let me tell you, that's what they put in there, right? So I love the parameters. It's like the big picture. How many square foot does the room have? Does the house have to be overall? What kind of landscaping will it have? What kind of climate will it be in? And therefore, what materials will you need to use? Um, she also made them do some budgeting in terms of like, what is car she had them look up like what does carpeting versus hardwood floor cost? And what does paint cost? And what does furniture cost? And all of these things too. Um, and then she um, had them draw an actual blueprint to make sure that what they were envisioning would actually work in the real world. We're lucky enough that our associate head of school for facilities is a licensed architect on staff. So he was able to come into the class and actually teach them how to draw these blueprints and give them some tips and spend a little time with them there. And then they did their calculations based on her geometrical requirements. And then we found an app that our students could use that's actually really professionally used to design um, in a 3D environment. We found a way to make sure that it was okay for our students who are under 18 to use it. We had the accounts created in a way that their information wasn't associated with it, and they were able to use that on their iPads. So, thank you. So, um, so this is just you know starting to use the app and exploring the design elements that are a part of the app, and then this is you can see the house is starting to kind of come together here. Um, and then again, this is just another example. See, like this one, it, it has a little bit of a problem because see how there's like a weird hallway there, right? So you can see there was some, they had to work and struggle a little bit to make it work. But then in the end, they got to do these really awesome presentations. The teacher had them wear like a shirt and tie and a blazer and a bunch of adults from around campus came in and presented. 
and um, they were like really proud of their creations and um, it was it ended up being a little bit of a throwdown like whose house is the coolest at the end um, and they were really invested and you can see how many adults were there to see them. Who was the coolest house? Um, I think the coolest house was the house that had like the biggest video game room and then like they had like a like a VR area because boys and teenage boys and video games are like best friends right, right now so um, so and you can see the gentleman who's on the right he's the architect so he was there through the process not every day but enough that they were able to build a relationship with a different adult on campus too which was a nice experience for them so I'm gonna hop right into science I love this project because it's like really not what you would think a scientist would put together, but this is for freshman biology. She was teaching them about cell organelles, um, and instead of just giving them a test, she wanted them to really have create a way to demonstrate that they really understood the function of all the different cell organelles. It's really an important basic concept to build off for the rest of the school year. So she put together, this is a structure, right? I always want to show the structure. This really awesome rubric so they knew exactly what had to be in the project. But what they did, and this is around the same time as the um, presidential election. She wanted them to, in a small group, choose a cell organelle and create a campaign advertisement for their organelle to become president of the cell. Why is your organelle the most important, the most, um, like the, the best one? So I'm gonna play the video for you on this, just so it doesn't mess with my slideshow. So I'm going to stop it here, but see how there's more left in the video? Oh, yeah. So after they did their video to get people to vote for their organelle, they had to create two attack ads against other organelles. <laughs> so that's what the rest of the video is. <laughs> They're awesome. Um, so I'm skipping around because I'm tired. I, I have like... I have like eight examples that I haven't gotten through all eight, so I'm jumping to one that I haven't been able to talk to yet. Um, um, so this is in a high school English class. They had just read Mary Shelley's Frank St Frankenstein, and again, like your typical literary um, analysis essay is like the sort of the hallmark of the English classroom. But English teachers in particular are like it's really important that we teach them how to write, so they have to write the formal essay like every time we read a book. So this teacher was like, all right. They write a lot. Let's come up with a way to make their writing into something that they value, right? So he was looking at your typical like long-form online journalism, like the New York Times, the Boston Globe, where there's embedded videos and interactive elements. And he goes, what if they wrote something that's still really good analysis, but it relates to Frank Frankenstein to the present day, and it has more multimedia embedded? So he created a model web page for his students called in Frankenstein's Shadow, and that's kind of the name of the project. They had to look into um, a technological advancement, present day, that's like just kind of burgeoning and just cutting edge, right? And compare it to the way people think of those really cutting edge technologies as like magic. How is that similar to the experience of the people in Frankenstein when they're seeing this like thing that really science can't explain and it violates all of the societal norms and all of that? Um, and they had to build a web page. <coughs> so I'm going to pull up the, my favorite one. <coughs> so one of the students um, had, he has a pacemaker. So he did his on cardiac technology. Basically, things that keep people's hearts beating when the hearts can't keep themselves beating. And this is, you know, he's a high school student who has his own pacemaker, and so he designed this web page where you can see his his research, and then he embedded some videos that he found that help explain like what is a heart attack. So what are the conditions that might make it so that a person might need these things? Um, repairing arteries. He links out to other resources. He actually has images of heart surgery, and then he explains what a pacemakers can do. Um, and he compares all of it to types of pacemakers, drawbacks of pacemakers. Um, yep. 
<laughs> right, and that's the thing. Like, right. they were still writing, right? Um, lots of video in here. And then comparing it to to Shakespeare, I mean, telemetry. It's, like, so impressive. Um, and so this, I mean, that's one of them, but there was there were some on, like, um, there was like something on AI and I forget in what industry and like, you know, there's the ethics of all of that and tying that into Frankenstein. So that was another really great example. Um, let me see which other ones I have here. So I teach social, eighth grade social studies and we just did a unit on, um, I had to do a mini unit on the middle passage, which is really heavy to teach, you know, eighth grade, 13 year old boys. So coming up with a way to teach that, <coughs> I mean, obviously you want to teach it with primary sources. So I go to, you know, good old Stanford History Education Group for a text set. Their text set for the Middle Passage is a lot of Equiano's first-hand account of being, you know, under the deck of someone kidnapped from Africa on the Middle Passage. They also have a ship doctor's account and they have a ship captain's account. So I could have them write your five-paragraph essay, right, um, with the primary sources embedded. But what we ended up doing is we listened to an NPR podcast, like a broadcast of the interview of a historian related to slavery in America. And I was like, so you guys are going to make your own podcast interviewing these people who were the authors of these primary sources about the Middle Passage. And you have to include direct quotes in your podcast. That's like my, my structure, right? Um, you have to write a transcript. You have to decide who's going to play which roles. You have to rehearse it, and then you're going to record it. And when I had them recorded, I had them... Um, put the, the audio recording into iMovie so that they could use some of the images that we had actually studied as part, as like the overlay. So they did a really good job with these. So this is, um, so you have to listen to this one. Because it's just... Hello everyone, I am Liam Donovan today, your reporter. This podcast is about how it truly felt to be a part of the Middle Passage. The goal of today's report is finding out information from people who have with see if we can get to lastly we will be hearing from Alauda Equiana, who was a former slave and experienced the Middle Passage as a slave. We began our first interview with Thomas Phillips, who was a former slave ship captain. Okay, Captain Phillips, let's begin this interview. Was it clean where the slave stayed? The place where the slaves stayed were as clean as we could make it. We were keeping their logins as clean and sweet as possible. Oh, so were the slaves clean? They were. So that's a direct quote, as clean as sweet as possible from the, uh, the captain's account. And as you as we listen, you hear that they had to come up with their own questions, their own answers, and there's tons of primary source quotes like built right into it. They really did a fantastic job. The last one I want to show you is, this is from a, an English teacher. They read Macbeth. Um, and again, the literary essay, right? Um, she said, instead of like studying the archetypes of Macbeth in kind of a vacuum, let's compare them to real people who lived, either historically or now. So she had a student who compared Macbeth to David Ortiz. <coughs> and he had to do research. And he had to, um, you know, demonstrate his research inside all of his sources. But then his final product was an infographic instead of an essay. So we had to take all this research he did and really distill it down to the main points and also think about color and image symbol symbolism to really express what he was trying to do. So um, I think that was cool too because it was something that they could actually display in their classroom and again they invited people to come to so sort of show their work, which is so different from when they hand in the essay and no one ever sees it except their teacher. Right. So yeah. That's great. Yeah. All right. Thanks you guys. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for coming.